Since the global pandemic, a lot of issues and problems, particularly in foreign policy, have understandably moved to the background, but they haven't gone away. And a prime example is the country of Turkey, where arguably the situation is getting worse. Turkey lies at the edge of Europe and the Middle East, not only geographically, but also in a sense politically. For many years, Turkey was hailed as a modern, secular, pro-Western Muslim society, and it was a member of, it is still a member of NATO. But a lot has changed in just the last two decades. From an officially secular, relatively free country, Turkey has marched towards Islamist dictatorship and alliances with jihadist groups. How did this come about? What broader lessons can we learn here about the influence of Islamist ideas? I'm delighted to have with me today, Dr. Michael Rubin. He's one of the few scholars going back many years who was vocal in pointing out the ominous trend in Turkey and its implications. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Elon. So just a brief word of introduction about you. Uh, so uh, Michael is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he specializes in uh, Iran, Turkey, and the broader Middle East. And he's traveled in the region widely. He's lived in Iran, Yemen, uh, even Iraq. Uh, he was a former Pentagon official, and he now regularly teaches classes to deployed US Navy and Marine units. I should mention that Michael is also the author of a number of books. I'll mention just two that I've learned a lot from. One is Dancing with the Devil, The Perils of Engaging Rogue Regimes, which came out in 2014. And he's also the co-author of another really good book that I've learned a lot from is uh, Eternal Iran, Continuity and Chaos, which was out in 2005. So I've been eager, eager to have you on for a while now. I'm glad we made the time. So let's dive in, Michael. So you know, I think it would be useful to start with some context because Turkey is not a country a lot of people sort of think a lot about or know a lot about. So one of the things that stands out about Turkey is that it's a Muslim majority country, but for many of its sort of last hundred years or so, it's been on the premise of being sort of con self-consciously secular. So just give us some of the background, like a sketch of wh what's the situation in Turkey for the, since the 20th century, just so we get a sort of a, the context for the arc of how Turkey's changed. Well, Turkey arose out of the ashes of the former Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire collapsed more than 100 years ago now, and modern Turkey was founded in 1923. So Turkey is now nearing its, its 100th anniversary. The person who founded modern Turkey, a guy named Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, or the father of the Turks, was a military hero who was the person who ensured that what is now Turkey wouldn't be divided among various European powers uh, and so forth. And so when you consider that history, that Turkey arose out of plans to divide it, there's always been a certain xenophobia inside of Turkey, especially towards Europe and the West, that these powers might try to take us apart, that they have it in for us. At the same time, Mustafa Kemal out of Turkey was a dictator but he was a dictator who basically argued that all the faults of the Ottoman Empire could be repaired and Turkey could become a modern state if only he separated mosque and state and learned to look like the West, learned to um, model Turkey from the West. And so overnight almost, Turkey adopted the Western, the Latin alphabet. It, um, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk mandated that all Turks had last names. He made education mandatory, both for boys and for girls. And he basically modeled Turkey to be a European country. Now, his, he died of cirrhosis of the liver quite young. And he was actually then succeeded by someone from his own political party, a political party called the Republican People's Party. And they basically controlled things until 1950. Then you had a series of uh, other political parties come into play. Ataturk's political party continues to exist. But basically, the way to think about Turkey is, while you were supposed to have a separation of mosque and state, you had this fierce competition between the left in Turkey and the right in Turkey. Many, and then on top of which, you had the religious people or the religious parties that may have felt that they weren't getting fully enfranchised simply because the parties didn't represent them. Well, you had almost like a pendulum effect through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, where various parties would consolidate control or seek to consolidate control, 
And that would end up leading to abuses of power, abuses of the Constitution, and then you would have a military coup. A lot of people talk about military coups in Turkey. The thing that made Turkey different than a banana republic, for example, is when the military took power in Turkey in 1960, for example, in 1980 as well, it didn't seek to keep power. What it tried to do was fill in the problems within the Constitution that allowed the system to get out of whack, adjust and calibrate the checks and balances, and then step out of power. And so that was consistently what happened in Turkey until Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who's currently the president, came onto the scene back in 2002. That's actually a little bit earlier if we want to look at his mayoralty in Istanbul. But basically, that's how things go. I mean, in summary, you had Ataturk orient Turkey towards the West. You had this sort of pendulum tension in Turkish politics between the right and the left, which would often erupt in street battles and so forth. The military would come in to try to right the ship and then step out. But ultimately, the mainstream political parties um, simply weren't filling some of the gap. And you had the rise of the Islamists. And that's symbolized by Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who without doubt is the country's dictator today. Now, you, I've heard people attribute this statement to Erdogan from before he took power. I think four or five years before he took power. It, it goes something like, uh, I think I've got it verbatim here. Democracy is just the train we board to reach our destination. Um, and uh, so that's what he was saying sort of to Turkish audiences, but um, to foreign audiences, one of the things he was saying was, you know, we're, the, the Turkish government is going to remain the, the guarantor and protector of all religious beliefs. It's a, a protector of secular government. So which way did it actually go? And what do, you, what do you take from his train uh, uh, quotation? What, what's the I mean, the, first of all, with, there's a lot of quotations by Erdogan which have been ignored in the West. A lot of these were compiled back in 2008 in a prosecution case which argued that Erdogan's political party had actually violated the law. So he talks about how democracy, like you said, is like a streetcar. You ride it as far as you need and then you step off. He also describes himself as the imam of Istanbul rather than the mayor of Istanbul. And he describes his mission as being the servant of the Sharia or Islamic law. So there's certainly plenty to look at in his youth to show that perhaps he was saying one thing to the Turkish audience and another thing to the um, to Western press. Now, he, if you want to look at his upbringing, he grew up in Eastern Turkey. He came from a very impoverished family. Um, he tried to get into one of the elite university systems in uh, university schools called the Mokeya in, in Turkey. He didn't make that. And so he ended up um, doing two things. First of all, going to basically a madrasa, or in Turkey, they call them Imam Hatip colleges. So it's a religious college. And at the same time, he played soccer, semi-professional soccer, and he also did a menial, um, menial job uh, working in a... Um, a street rail, rail company. The point of this is very conservative upbringing, religious education, and a chip on his shoulder because when he tried to join elite Turkish society, I mean, the Mokeya is like the Turkish equivalent of the Sorbonne or the American equivalent of Harvard or Yale. When, when he got nixed from that, he had a chip on his shoulder. Now, I would argue in answer to your question that he's always been more of an ideologue, but what we tend to get in the Western debate is, is he using religion because he's a true believer, or is he using religion as a cynical tool in order to accumulate power for other reasons? In other words, is he like a sultan, or is he like Vladimir Putin? Yeah, so I'm, I'm more, in, sort of con more persuaded by the view that ideas and religion loom large in his thinking. And I, so, because, you know, one of the things I've, I've read about Turkey and I've read some of your writings on this is just the extent to which he's sort of injected religion into society and sort of on a conscious sort of plan of, of transforming it. So, so, I mean, maybe you can just sort of sketch out what you've seen in terms of the, this campaign to, to reshape and bring Islamic ideas so more into governing, more into power in Turkey? Well, 
I mean, there shouldn't even be any debate on this, Ilan. I mean, he declared his program to raise a religious generation. And he has constantly um, sought to pillory, to ridicule, to demonize those who would embrace more traditional Turkish secularism. But if we want to go back to his beginning, okay, so after he had gone to this religious school, he ended up working for a religious political party that no longer exists. Um, it was dissolved back in 1997 because of its Islamism, because it was violating the constitution and so forth. He then, um, he subsequently joined, created a new political party. He had become mayor of Istanbul as well. He had been arrested when he was mayor of Istanbul for religious incitement, talking about how the minarets will be our bayonets and so forth. Anyway, the big point goes back to 2001 and 2002. In 2001, 2002, you have five political parties in Turkey, they're sharing power, but the Turkish economy goes into crisis in a single day. 35, the Turkish lira lost 35% of its value. And people looked at all the incumbents and didn't see any sort of anywhere they could turn. And I'm not just talking the religious people, I'm talking about the middle class, the business community and so forth. Here comes Erdogan who said, basically, I've learned from my past. I don't wanna change the system, but I want a clean government. And so the thing that happened in actually November, 2002, is Erdogan won first place in the elections. Now, ironically, because he had been arrested, he wasn't able to actually go into power directly. But there's a quirk in the Turkish election system, which is in order to take power, you need to get 10% of the votes. Well, I said there were five, in, um, five incumbent parties. Four of those five basically failed to meet the threshold, just barely. And so when Erdogan got 32% of the votes, or 34% of the votes, that ended up being 66% of the seats in parliament. So for the first time, Islamists not only ruled in Turkey, they had a super majority, Erdogan could do what he wanted. So what did he want? Now, a lot of this was very smart, very sharp, technocratic maneuvering. Turkey has something called the TMSF. It's basically the Turkish equivalent of our FDIC that insures banks the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. It used to be a technocratic body. What Erdogan did was he basically replaced all the members of that board with people who had a background in Islamic banking. And then he used that board to basically do stress tests on other banks and other businesses in order to shut them down or levy huge, in some cases like $2 billion fines on political adversaries. Anyone, I mean, politicians would say anyone who would donate to an uh, opposition politician would suddenly find the auditors at their door and engage them in an expensive multi, I mean, multi-month, multi-year process that could shut them down permanently. So this is the type of thing Erdogan did. At the same time, he said, we need affirmative action. The, the, the conservative Turks, the religious Turks have been discriminated against. The way the Turkish education system works, they have... Um, three three categories. The regular sort of liberal arts education, the Imam Hatip religious school education, which I talked about before, and vocational education. So at the end, basically at the end of your high school, you can choose which one to go into and you have to take a test. If you get into a Imam Hatip school, a religious seminary, chances are you wouldn't get the prerequisites in order to um, then go further into the educational system, into universities and so forth. We're talking a high school level now. So what Erdogan did is say, well, in their equivalent of the SATs, anyone who went to a religious school should have a factor of like, I forget what it is, maybe 1.2 or 1.4 that you multiply their score by in order to equalize this. But then what you had is you had a lot of religious people who had never had a basis in Western liberalism enter the universities and those universities were the prerequisites to enter government. But again, it was a meritocracy in Turkey. So you had tests and you still weren't having these people meet the threshold for the tests. So what Erdogan did was say, okay, we need not only to have an objective component, 
but we need to have a subjective component too to ensure that people are good, loyal Turks. And so we're gonna have an interview process. And what that interview process did in effect was take people who otherwise had never had any Western liberal background and hadn't scored well on their tests and put them in the permanent bureaucracy. And this is how Erdogan slowly undid all the checks and balances and the building blocks. But there's one aspect in law that is on the West. There's this notion in the United States, but more especially in Europe, that the military is anti-democratic, especially military involvement in politics. And in the United States, certainly we, we get that. But the job of the military in Turkey, it was a check and balance. Its job wasn't to hold power, but it was to ensure that the constitution was abided by. And whenever it wasn't, we talked about the various short-term coups. Well, what Erdogan said was the military is anti-democratic. We need to undo the military's role in, in democracy and government. And I'm all for that. But Europe and the United States didn't insist that there first be an alternate check and balance put into play. So as soon as the military was unraveled from its guarantor position of the Turkish constitution, that's when we started seeing most of these abuses occur because there is no one, there is nowhere else or no other check and balance to stop Erdogan from fulfilling his ambition. I mean, the Speaker of Parliament actually said back in 2005, uh, before Erdogan became president, when the president had vetoed, I'm sorry, when the constitutional court had vetoed legislation deeming it unconstitutional, he said, you better watch out because we have such a majority in parliament that we can disband the constitutional court if you keep ruling against us. And that's the type of thing he did. So Michael, so you described how um, there's a kind of privileging of people who went to religious schooling as bringing them into the bureaucracy when they would not have otherwise have maybe gotten in based on their uh, ed education. And then sort of the, the eroding of the, the one safety valve for uh, secularism, which was the, the role of the military. So what does it look like for Erdogan to, cr to raise a quote, pious generation, as you put it earlier? What does that impact? How does that look like in, in sort of just day to day schooling? Like if you go to school, what does it mean? Well, Turkey is, even though it's mostly Muslim, it's religiously diverse. I mean, you have more than a quarter of the population who are what's called Alevis. And this is sort of like a Shia offshoot sect. And traditionally, Turkey never had a complete split between mosque and state. You would have religious education, but basically it would be an elective. Your parents could say, okay, I want them to have Jewish education, Christian education, Sunni education, or a Levi education. Um, what Erdogan did was basically say, no, there's only one Islam. And therefore he took this quarter of the population that didn't actually believe in the Sunni Islam that Erdogan believed and basically put them in religious indoctrination classes. On top of which, uh, Turkey also used to have checks and balances that they would allow supplementary religious education, sort of like we have Sunday schools in the US, but they would put age limits on it and hours per week on it, and it would be regulated. Erdogan eviscerated those controls, so you could have basically guys who are graduating from Saudi madrasas come and start teaching people, six-year-olds, 30 hours a week instead of having regulated people teach two hours a week. Um, and so you had this sort of brainwashing occur as well. But then there's just the passage of time. I mean, Erdogan has now been in power for um, more than 17 years. And so you've got a situation where that's basically everyone from birth to their senior year in high school has been educated under Erdogan. And you have the same tort of religious incitement, which you used to have in Saudi Arabia, which you have in Qatar, which you have in the Palestinian Authority going on in Turkey now. Or the military, which used to be the guardianship of uh, the constitution, people used to think of it as secular. Anyone up to the lieutenant colonel level, just by natural attrition, has basically had their career made by Erdogan. Likewise, because he's upset the traditional promotion system, Anyone who's basically a two-star general or above owes their career to Erdogan. So even if Erdogan disappeared tomorrow, you'd have a situation where you've had a generation which has been brainwashed. Now, here's the irony. When people do polls of Turks, there's actually a backlash towards some of this religiosity, simply because young people don't like having state-sponsored religion shoved down their throat. 
There's also, if I may, Alam, one last thing going on. A lot of people hear about the dispute in Turkey between Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the president, and a dissident cleric who's based in now the Poconos in Pennsylvania called Fatullah Gulen. Make no mistake, both Fatullah Gulen and Recep Tayyip Erdogan are Islamists, and they have a strong record of Islamism. The difference between the two, and in many ways, the reason why they're clashing the way they are, is that Fatullah Gulen represents a traditional sort of Sufi Anatolian native to Turkey Islam, where Recep Tayyip Erdogan represents something that's much closer to the Muslim Brotherhood, which is also why you've had so much tension, even among those who are religious inside Turkey. So one of the things I, I've really been struck by in reading about Turkey is that you know, Turkey was one of the first Muslim majority countries to have a woman in a top leadership role. And it, Turkey was one of those places where it was not a hard, it was not difficult to find a drink if you wanted one. And, you know, women were more liberated than they are in most Arab, sort of Arab countries, if you think about Muslim countries elsewhere. And uh, there's this kind of but, but th that's been fading and women's place in society has changed over time. So what does it look like today? I mean, what have you seen in that respect? You're absolutely right. I mean, one of the most shocking statistics, and this actually comes from Turkey's interior ministry, is that since Erdogan came into power, the murder rate of women has increased more than 1,400%. Now, I went to Turkey and I asked some politicians about this, and a lot of people who support Erdogan who say, oh, this is just better reporting. But a lot of the other pol politicians say, no, no, no. This is because of honor crimes, honor killing, religiously motivated violence. Uh, and people feel that they have impunity because the, more con the now conservative police force isn't going to um, really hold accountable someone who um, killed their daughter or their wife for adultery or for sex out of wedlock or so forth. There's another Turkish study, I mean, from inside Turkey, which just shows, look, it wasn't just um, Tansu Çiller, who is one of the first female um, leaders of a Muslim majority state. I mean, you also had that in Bangladesh and Pakistan as well, but putting that aside, it wasn't just the top. You had ministers, um, and I'm not just talking about minister of women's affairs. I'm talking about much more substantive uh, core ministries, which were led by women. And not just the minister positions, you had the deputies, the undersecretary levels, all of those. You had a significant, a significant role for women, which has declined, I think, now to something point, like 0.3% of the people at the top levels of Turkish ministries are women. And Erdogan himself said, no women woman should want to come into government or have a career, they should have at least three children before they make such a decision. That's, just, that's really horrifying to me. Um, one thing I wanted to, you said, you mentioned you, you talk to people in Turkey and officials. Uh, you know, one of the things I've noticed in particularly recently, and especially since 2016, when there was the failed coup, is there's been a real crack down on freedom of speech to the extent there was some under Erdogan. So what, what do you, you know, you've talked to some journalists, what are you seeing? What have you heard? What's been the, so has there been changes that are more uh, sort of lasting? Well, absolutely. I mean, starting 10 years ago, when you would go to Turkey, people would sit down with you, but they'd insist that you took your cell phone out and took the battery out of the cell phone. That's the type of behavior you see in a state where people believe that they're always being listened to, that it's a police state, that they're paranoid. I would also notice a situation where, um, and, and lots of people who watch Turkey will talk about this, you're in a situation where you, ha you have good Turkish friends and you won't talk, they'll just go silent. And then when they're in Germany or when they come to the United States, then they will call you. And it will be like old times, but everyone's afraid to talk on the phone. What you have in Turkey now is um, Erdogan, has instituted uh, two things. First of all, he has ramped up, he has, he's initiated thousands of prosecutions for so-called insulting the president. And insulting the president could simply mean, I disagree with his policies. Um, and so you've got a situation where anyone who criticizes Erdogan 
will have lawsuits levied against them. At the same time, oftentimes, if you are advocating, for example, um, for peace, a peace process with the Kurds, or for better uh, sectarian relations between Christians and Muslims, Erdogan could say that you are guilty of terrorist propaganda because you're, you're somehow giving um, political legitimacy to those who would want to make peace, who would counter the Turkish army. And so he has arrested hundreds, if not thousands of people on that, uh, on that charge as well, including the leaders of some of the opposition political parties. Um, lastly, ever since the coup, Erdogan, let, let's, let's be honest, between 2013, before 2013, Erdogan used to work with this guy Fethullah Gulen. It was Erdogan and Gulen, the two Islamists, against the secularists. Once Erdogan believed he had the upper hand on the secularists, then he took on his competitor, Fethullah Gulen. And those who, who followed Gulen, he, Erdogan created a term which is widespread in the Turkish press, FETO the Fethullah um, terrorist organization. And basically, it's, an, it's a name that only Erdogan and his supporters use, but they accuse anyone who was the supporter of this dissident cleric um, of, uh, of basically being a terrorist. I mean, frankly, in my case, I'm not a supporter of Fethullah Gulen, but I've been branded a Feto terrorist simply because I've contradicted Erdogan in my analysis, and it really does have a chilling relationship, uh, a chilling, um, it creates a chilling environment for free speech where if you say something the president doesn't like, then you can be charged with terrorism and thrown in prison. And by the way, Turkey doesn't have bail. And therefore, if you're thrown in prison, you could be thrown awaiting, awaiting your trial for years. And a lot of people haven't, ha haven't lived through the, that period where they're expecting their preliminary hearing. I read a, a, a statistic about the number of journalists who are jailed uh, in Turkey. And I think Turkey out, outclasses even uh, China in terms of how many uh, journalists. And the other thing that I remember uh, is the, there used to be some independent newspapers in Turkey. What's the situation with that? I mean, are there still people, voices in the press that can speak out without you know, fear? Well, Two, thing, two points there. First of all, the report you're referencing, Ilan, comes from Reporters Without Borders or Reporters Sans Frontières. And what it does, they, every year they release an index of press freedom. And back in 2012, they decreed that Turkey had become the largest jail for journalists in the world um, on a per capita level. And then also, I think, um, for several years on um, just a level of total number of journalists arrested. Um, Ibrahim Kalin, who used to be a professor at Georgetown University, is now the president's spokesman. And he will simply say, we have never arrested a journalist for journalism. We've arrested them for other crimes like terrorism and murder and that sort of thing. But, but this, again, this is nonsense. It should raise some um, concerns in places like Georgetown about how they had a guy like this on the faculty, uh, on the faculty there. But let's put that aside for a second. Um, the second issue, could you just remind me, I, I had your answer, but for the second. Yeah, so, I mean, there was a time, at least in recent memory, the where there were independent or private oh, yeah. newspapers and, and media outlets. What does that look like today? Well, I, I had mentioned at the beginning of our talk that you had this bureau which would come and levy huge fines. In one famous case against the Duan Group, which was a Turkish conglomerate that owned several media companies, including Horiat, they leveled a $2 billion fine. And eventually, Duan, who owned the, the outlet, basically sold it. And this is the pattern. You do have some independent newspapers. But what's happened is most of those have gone online. And they're now being published from outside Turkey so that Turkey doesn't have direct control. But Erdogan is coming back to try to control even them by um, saying that all social media, as well as Wikipedia, should be banned in Turkey. Um, because he got tired of people simply using, um, using um, Twitter and so forth, or Facebook, to pass around articles which were published by the same journalists they used to read 10 years ago, but now have fled to Sweden or Germany or the United States. So, Michael, we've, we've talked about how uh, Erdogan has sort of impacted 
domestic policy and reshaped institutions and, and education, I want to just turn a little to pivot towards how Turkey, or Erdogan in particular, how does he relate to other countries in the region? In particular, um, he, he seems to have become much more vocal about um, sort of trying to be as like a standard bearer for Islam in the region and being very vocal anytime he feels Islam is being slighted or, or offended and things like that. So what, what do you think is going on with him? Why well, are you doing that? Made, okay, you can look at phases of Erdogan's foreign policy uh, in three, three categories or, or three time periods. The first one was no problem with neighbors, only he had a lot of problems with his neighbors. Then he talked about how there's gonna be neo-Ottomanism. This was the idea coined by his um, former foreign minister, Ahmed Davidalu. And the problem with this was that a lot of Turks had a much fonder remembrance of the Ottoman Empire than the subject peoples of the Ottoman Empire had. So he didn't find much there. Then he's turned towards pan-Islamism. Um, he has especially been looking at outreach into Africa. Um, and in many ways, what I would argue is that Erdogan and Turkey are to the 21st century, what Saudi Arabia was to the late um, to the second half of the 20th century, in which Saudi Arabia in the second half of the 20th century was using tremendous resources of the state in order to proselytize and to spread a much more um, intolerant and extreme version of Islam worldwide. And frankly, we're still paying the price for that. That is now what Turkey is doing inside both Europe, but especially in Africa. I mentioned before Fethullah Gulen. And one of the aspects of Fethullah Gulen, this traditional um, theologian who embraced sort of Sufi Anatolian thought, was that he created this huge network of schools, including some in the United States. Many of these schools were confiscated uh, in other countries by Erdogan. And he created something called the Ma'arif Foundation to take them over. And then what he started to do was basically just, instead of shutting them down, he tended to take the resources which were built by his rival and he's using them as engines of um, proselytization and extremism. We see this in Somalia, we see this in Chad, we see this in Ghana, Senegal. If you read the Turkish newspapers, they talk about how uh, kids from these countries have gone to a Turkish school in those countries, memorized the Quran and, and won a free trip to Turkey. And they're interviewed and they talk about how they wanna go back and spread, uh, spread the word of Islam as Erdogan sees it. It's really a dangerous situation right now. Yeah, and one thing that sticks in my memory, because I've written about, um, Israel in the Middle East and its relations with other countries. And one of the things I remember in my research was the, you, you, I'm sure you remember this, um, in 2014, there was a, um, a, a flotilla of ships going to Gaza to bring, uh, ostensibly to bring the aid. And there, was, so. right, and there was a big scandal of that. And um, what that brought to light was just how supportive Erdogan has been with, toward Hamas, the Islamist group that controls Gaza now. Uh, so what is, uh, I mean, is that an outlier? How does he view that relationship, do you think? Unfortunately, it's not an outlier. Theologically, if you want to understand the exegesis which has occurred uh, in Erdogan's political religious thought, it much, it hews much closer to the Muslim Brotherhood line. Now, a lot of, we have a debate in the United States about whether the Muslim Brotherhood is all extremists. And we can say, look, over time, the Muslim Brotherhood is a huge organization and it's had various um, intellectual schisms within it. Um, what is of concern is that Erdogan comes from this Muslim Brotherhood sort of view, which is the path to redemption is to throw out all sort of the influences of the West. That's basically the Muslim Brotherhood in a core, but he, he seems sympathetic to the more violent lines of this. So we see this with regard to Hamas. We see this with regard to um, some of the factions in Libya, or take a theology professor named Ahmed Kavash. Erdogan appointed him as a political appointee to Chad. And back in 2012, when we had Al-Qaeda take over Mali, and the French then came in to fight Al-Qaeda, um, Erdogan basically, I'm sorry, Ahmed Kavash said, well, 
who's the real terrorists? Al-Qaeda aren't terrorists. It's the French that are terrorists. We should be supporting Al-Qaeda. Now, is that the exception rather than the rule? You tell me, because Erdogan just rewarded Ahmed Kavash with another appointment as ambassador to Senegal. Wow. I mean, the, the, I don't want to get too much into Syria because it's its own. We should have a separate conversation about that. But yeah. one of the things I, I'm struck by is that, so Syria, for people who don't, are not familiar with the map, so Syria has a border with Turkey. And, you know, with the rise of the Islamic State, there's a lot of concern about how are people getting there? How are the, the you know, all these migrants who want to become part of the Islamic State before it fell? And a lot of them went through Turkey. Uh, I mean, just, it, so was that, I mean, how do you read that? Was that Turkey turning a blind eye? Was it just incompetence? How, how did that happen? And no, it, it, Elon, it was absolutely an active decision because we saw not only the transit of 90% of foreign fighters for, uh, to the Islamic State, um, often with the facilitation of people involved with the AKP, but we also saw, and the Turkish press had exposed before, um, in, certain ca in the case of Zamoriyet, which means um, the editor John Dundar had to flee, they, um, they had reported on arms shipments from the Turkish intelligence service to Al-Qaeda-linked factions and Islamic State-linked factions um, in the north of Syria. We also had, um, in Istanbul's airport, you had people um, who were openly talking in the corridors of the airport about how they had were an r and r from waging jihad on behalf of the Islamic State, on top of which we now know from seized documents, as well as prisoner um, um, discussions and interrogations, debriefings are, is the word I'm thinking of, debriefings with prisoners, that there was actually an Islamic State ambassador inside Turkey. Um, you've had a situation in which the Turks refused to classify the Islamic State um, in their official listings as a terrorist group as well. Um, and one of the problems we now face is Turkey, um, first of all, the US decision to rely for, on Turkey for security in Northern Syria um, has led Turkey to empower a lot of these groups. And we actually have a database of Islamic State veterans, which are now working for the Turks. And some of these have now been shipped into Libya. Uh, these are guys with a great deal of blood on their hands. The head of intelligence, uh, for example, for Raqqa, which was the Islamic State capital, was working for the Turks until quite recently. And it's a huge problem we have. So, Michael, I, I, we're coming up to the end of our time. There's one more question I wanted just to get your perspective on. And so what you're describing, what, I, what I'm taking from this conversation is that this is not, not a hidden phenomenon. This has been going on pretty openly in Turkey. You, you've learned about this. You don't have sort of insider information. And how do you, I mean, I don't think this is a Trump administration only kind of situation or an Obama. So it seems like it's an ongoing thing with our approach to Turkey. What's your, how do you explain sort of the, the fact that Turkey is still seen in, very, in a very positive light sort of from our foreign policy establishment? Well, two, two broad points. First of all, the broader problem within the State Department is uh, wishful thinking. We're much more willing to calibrate our foreign policy to what we wish Turkey would be rather than to recognize what it's become. And somehow it's seen as a failure or undiplomatic to acknowledge that things have fundamentally changed. The wishful thinking uh, extends to those who believe, hey, Erdogan's a problem, but if he's gone, then we can, we can have that relationship with Turkey once again. Um, I, I think, again, it's just wishful thinking. And what I would ask any single diplomat is, OK, what is the absolute red line at which that Erdogan must cross before you would say, we're no longer going to deal with him? Would it be support for Al Qaeda? Would it be uh, support for religious incitement? Would it be support for the Islamic State? Well, he's crossed all of those. The other problem beyond that problem which is mostly just within the State Department at this point, is the fact that Erdogan, in many ways, he's the president whisperer. And he, was, he managed to have very tight relations with Barack Obama, uh, talking about how he called Erdogan to get advice on raising teenage girls, how uh, he told um, CNN back in an interview, um, Obama did, that Erdogan was one of his top five uh, most trusted friends. Um, and then, frankly, he's done the same thing with Donald Trump. So what Erdogan tries to do, knowing that he's lost a great deal of the US bureaucracy at this point, 
is simply leapfrog over all of it in order to reach directly to the Oval Office. He's going to be in deep trouble should the aides in the Oval Office prevent Erdogan from reaching uh, the U.S. president, whether it's Donald Trump or should Donald Trump lose in the forthcoming election, whether it's Joseph Biden. Well, thank you very much. It's been really enlightening. I appreciate your joining us today, Michael. Thanks. Thanks, Alon. I hope you found that conversation with Michael Rubin enlightening as much as I did. And I wanted to close by offering a few takeaways from that conversation. The first one is that the story of Turkey's transformation is a story of a concerted effort to reshape a society in the, in, in the mold of an Islamist ideology, the idea of Islam being dominant as a force in society. I think the evidence for that in Turkey is overwhelming. One consequence of a society built around uh, Islam as a, as a political ideology is that it, it is going to be hostile as Turkey has proven itself to be. And it's aligned with a number of, of groups and, and regimes that are enemies of the United States. So that's the first point, that Turkey has been transformed over time as a concerted effort in, in the mold of an Islamist regime. I think a second takeaway is that there's a real lesson here about how authoritarian regimes come to power and the kind of mechanisms they use and, and the, the, the way in which they gain power and crush freedom. I think Turkey has exhibit some of those ways of doing it. And, and one key point here is that I think Turkey is, a, is a, an authoritarian regime moving towards a dictatorship. But what's interesting about how it became authoritarian uh, in, in, uh, as Michael and I were talking is that it, it didn't take a cataclysmic event or some sort of crisis. I mean, there have been many crises in Turkey, but that wasn't really the key. It was small gradual steps that led to the sort of the erosion of freedom to the extent there was any in Turkey uh, and to the imposition of Erdogan's Islamist ideology. And finally, the, the last takeaway I wanna stress here, which I think is the wider, wider lesson, is that is, if you think that an Islamist regime looks only like Islamic State or like Saudi Arabia or Iran, which I think they are all Islamist regimes, or if you think back to the Taliban, which I think it is an Islamist regime, those aren't the only ways it can manifest. And I think Turkey is an, is an example of an Islamist regime, but it's not a totalitarian regime the way Iran or Saudi Arabia aspire to be, or the Taliban really was. Turkey is more authoritarian moving towards a dictatorship, but it is nevertheless essentially Islamist. And if you, fail to see that, then I think what's, what you're going to fail to see is the influence of Islamic ideas in a society and its, its power to capture people's imagination and, and what it looks like in practice. So I think it's important to see that there, uh, an Islamist regime can take different forms, though it's essentially rooted in the same idea about what is the relationship of religion to society. So I hope you'll be back with us next time for our podcast. And until then, goodbye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.